Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast. This is the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To learn about specific stocks I like, go to focuscompoundinggazette.com. That's focuscompoundinggazette.com, and enter your email. Once you enter your email, you'll start getting one free 2,000-word stock write-up a week. Andrew and I also manage accounts for clients. To learn more about our managed accounts, email Andrew at info at focuscompounding.com or text or call Andrew at 469-207-5844. Now here's Andrew with your regularly scheduled podcast. Alrighty, we are back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How is everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, here with Mr. Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going great, Andrew. How's it going with you? It is going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. Hey, if you have not checked out my YouTube videos, go to YouTube, type in Focused Compounding, and you'll see me. Uh, presenting a bunch of different topics. I am really going to stay consistent with YouTube. And honestly, it's not that fun if no one watches. But there's a lot of people that have been watching so (laughs) far. So keep watching and uh, send me some ideas. I'm in front of a whiteboard and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Follow me on Twitter at Focused Compound. Hey, if you're listening to this right now, you are in the New York area. Jeff and I are there right now. Yes, We're recording this in Dallas, but we're in New York when you're listening to this. So if you would like to meet up, uh, you're a prospective investor or just interested in talking stocks with us, which we love to do, uh, reach out to me at info at focuscompounding.com. Our calendar is uh, getting pretty booked. So uh, definitely just reach out uh, when you hear this and we'll see if we can, um, you know, get you on the books to meet up. It would be a lot of fun. Right. Yep. It would or be there fun. the whole week of the sixteenth. That's right. Whole week of the sixteenth. So uh, definitely reach out. So um, in today's podcast, um, we are going to be going over the two chapters that matter from everyone's favorite book, The Intelligent Investor. Right. Well, some people haven't seen your YouTube. Yeah, I know. So it is not your favorite book. Yeah. So if you're just a podcast listener, and there are many more podcast listeners than YouTube uh, viewers, uh, Andrew does videos. And in one of these videos, he talked about, what was it, 11, was it books? uh, So I actually, I think it was 11 or 12, but I had to cut it, actually, because I don't know if you noticed it, because I, like, misspoke on one of the numbers. I was, like, on, like, my eighth book, (laughs) when really it was, like, my ninth book or something. So, yeah, I I didn't stay consistent with it. All right, so it's around 10. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll go with 11. Value investing books. I don't know. And uh, the first ones, first two yeah. that you you uh, don't feel as strongly uh, positively about. I said, I think I recall saying, if you need something to fall asleep, yep. read these two books. And those two books are Security Analysis. I came out guns blazing, yep. trying to see... Uh, you know where that would take me, but yes, that's right. Yeah, security analysis and, and this book here, and the, the intelligent, intelligent investor. investor. Yes, I yeah. think it's they're both look, they're awesome books. I guess <laughs> read them if you like. I said need, we're only going to talk about a few paragraphs in chapter eight and chapter twenty. What I did say was that there was two chapters that are definitely pretty interesting out of the book. To be okay. fair, and we're going to be talking about both those chapters, which you just said, chapter eight and chapter twenty. Yeah, and chapter eight is Mr. Market, and Warren Buffett has said uh, that these two chapters are the most important chapters out the book. Yeah. And I think the most important chapter is ever written. That's right. Investing, so. Yeah. So Mr. Market is this um, hypothetical figure right. that they write about where if he were to come to you every single day and offer you a price for your business, mm-hmm. um, you know, what would that price be? He said in some days he may offer you for simple math, we'll say a thousand dollars and other days maybe he's feeling a little bit more um, excited and maybe he'll offer you fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars and then other days maybe he is feeling a little bit more depressive and he'll offer you seven hundred or eight hundred dollars right okay. and all this offering could go over let's say a span of a couple months uh-huh. right your business that you own still hasn't changed that much right but really what has changed is the emotions of mr market right and the idea is that he'll either buy or sell your choice sure right the price he names is what you'll either buy his share out at or sell your share to him at yes because that's the connection with the market because basically not always in the stocks that we buy but for most stocks uh you'll be able to get a price the bid and the ask will be pretty close so you could if the stock's around twenty five dollars you could either be a buyer at twenty five or sell at twenty five yeah. so the idea idea is that Mr. Market is offering to either sell to you or buy from you at that price. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And what are your thoughts? I mean, the way I always think about it, and I think this is the best way to describe it, is I always say that I like what Buffett has said, that the market in the short term, it's a voting machine, mm-hmm. voting upon traders trading, geopolitical events, right. Donald Trump 
trading, short term earnings, right. whatever, tweeting, not tweeting. Trading. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in the long term, it's a weighing machine, weighing to the true yep. fundamental facts of the business, and there in between lies opportunity. Yeah, and I that's the way that I've always thought about it. And upon even studying like other pretty successful investors, like we've we've spoken about Alum. Um, Mecca a lot on this yeah. podcast and how over the years he's owned a lot of the same companies that right. he has owned it, but he just kind of like handicaps them back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, the idea with that is so he knows those things well, and then the, the market price is just fluctuating a lot. And I think the big problem with it is, uh, what most people do is something else that Buffett said, which is basically the market's there to uh, serve you, not to instruct you. The mm-hmm. price is not telling you something. The price is something you take advantage of. And that's the big idea about the Mr. Market thing, is um, people should not think that if your stock is up, that means something positive about the stock, or if it's down, it means something negative. It just is a price that you can take advantage of. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important to know the price of a stock. I don't think it's very important to know uh, whether it's up or down. Mm-hmm. And I think people pay too much attention to the up or down and by how much rather than focusing a lot on exactly what the price is. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it kind of reminds me, I know Jeff Bezos in the earlier days of Amazon mm-hmm. when like the internet was going crazy and whatever, he yeah. would, had said he would tell his employees, you shouldn't feel two or three times smarter yeah. because the stock's up or you, just like you shouldn't feel two to three times dumber because, you know, the stock's down or whatever. Yeah, and know? that's the impressive thing about him because he could easily have felt a lot smarter than he was back totally. then. Totally, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and he definitely comes from, like, the Buffett camp of, like, mindset and everything. Mm-hmm. So you could definitely see that come through there. So how do you typically think about that um, when it comes to, like, buying stocks, like Mr. Market? Like, how do you think about it? Right, so um, I really don't, I mean... I don't think that, especially in the kind of stocks that we buy and sell, which are more illiquid, they're, they're less liquid, um, I don't th- tend to believe the market's valuation as much, um, as most people seem to. And we've talked about this before, but all that, the, all that you're seeing in the um, market price is those people who are participating in buying and selling in the open market. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give you a good idea of what the business would go for if it was sold in total. Um, we were just talking the other day about a business where probably two thirds of the people who own stock in it would value it a lot higher. Sure, you know, double the price probably yeah. is where they would start negotiating with each other about buying or selling it. Yeah, and yet it trades at half of that. Why does it trade half that? Because they're not in the market buying and selling. Yeah, sure. Right? And mm-hmm. the same thing can happen in a stock that we own. I mean, we own some stocks in which we'd be by far the biggest uh, buyer or seller on a given day. I mean, probably. Probably almost all the stocks we have, we would potentially be the biggest buyer or seller on a given day. Yeah. And yet, why, we're not participating in the market because there'd have to be a very big move in price for some of the stocks before we would uh, be a seller or something. You know. Mm-hmm. So it, it only inf- so in many stocks that you're looking at, there's a heavy influence of traders who are the ones who are turning the shares over very quickly. And in some very big stocks, there's even influence of computers and all sorts of other things that have yeah. to do with it. And especially, I think, you see a lot of influence of other things the shareholder base owns. So mostly stocks move around because of what kind of shareholders own them. Mm-hmm. And so if you have uh, a lot of institutional owners or whatever, then the stocks are going to be down with all the other things that they also own sure. that day. They're all going to move together basically with who sorts of, uh, sort of owns them. Whereas if you have stocks that are owned um, by a lot of individuals or something, they're going to move differently, mm-hmm. right? And that's because you're seeing in terms of uh, who makes up the market in, that, in those sorts of stocks. At what point do you realize that the market's right and you're wrong? Um, I don't know. That's a very good question. I've not found that to be true. When I've been wrong, uh, like it, you know it right away, you're wrong type of thing. Or is oh it no, because, I like, think I've been wrong. Thesis? No, it's sort of like Buffett. I was just reading something the other day where someone said Buffett lost a lot of money on airline uh, investment. No, he didn't. He didn't never lost a lot of money. That's a common misperception that people have that he made an airline investment in preferred stock and lost money on it. He didn't. What happened is he bought into uh, US Air Preferred. Uh, it. U.S. Air did terribly. Yeah. He should have lost money on it, but the airline industry recovered a bit, and he was able to sell out a profit on that. Um, the biggest mistakes I've made, I'd say, are not in things where I had a big paper loss on it. Mm-hmm. Is it um, so? Like, so one of the what? biggest was like Barnes and Noble. I realized I made a terrible mistake with Barnes and Noble. Why? Uh, because of how much they're putting into Nook. Got it. Yeah. So, that so they lost that the they proxy vote, that? and then they put a. Uh, so the the uh, Ron Barkle lost the proxy vote. Who was that proxy vote? Was was Pershing involved in that, or was it uh, Pershing was at the in time? Borders? Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I got. Um, so Burke was the one in um, Barnes and Noble, lost by a very small margin. Um, interesting one because depending on how certain people voted and stuff, there were some some funds apparently didn't vote correctly. Oh, really? They think they filled out some things incorrectly <laughs> and stuff. But it was very close to a 50-50 vote, about Pay as close to a, to a proxy vote as I've ever seen. And um, so the Regios were still in control. 
what? Yeah, yeah. So the Ridges were still in control, and um, uh, then they put a lot into Nook. And so I knew that was a really – the stock had become very, very risky and so sold. It, and yeah. I sold at, you know, uh, maybe a loss of 1% or something. I don't know the exact one. Uh, but basically, uh, even to where I bought it, yeah, not that yeah. long before. And um, but I felt that now the risk was huge compared to what it had been before. But the market didn't price that in immediately; it priced it in later. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. And you've you've talked about before how, um, like a lot of times when you've sold out of like positions or anything, it's because mm-hmm. like whatever thesis you had, they just kind of like they change it or like some capital allocation thing, such as right. putting more into Nook than you would have liked to see. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. Um, so I don't know that the market tells you much about that. And that's something that I question when people say that. I also question that, well, there's a few reasons. One, logically, I think it makes no sense. I don't think you can say I'm going to beat the market by taking advantage of the times when it's wrong about things, but I'm also going to use as an input uh, market prices to value things. Sure. So you know that when we talk about things, I like to know about things like what a 100% buyer paid for things in certain transactions, much more so than I like to know about uh, what the market price is of something. Mm-hmm. So for instance, I'm looking at some things in another country, and that industry uh, has comparable businesses here in the US. But over there, all the public companies trade at like half of what they trade at here. Okay, so people would say, well, there's a discount there. You should just lop off some of it because that's the t- typical discount for that country. Yeah. The funny thing is, in private transactions, that same discount Doesn't isn't exist. there. Yeah. So it makes you wonder, well, okay, are the businesses really inferior? And that's why you have to go look and see in terms of the returns on equity and things if they're inferior. Or is this an unpopular segment with the investing public in that yeah. uh, market, which basically means the mutual funds and, the, and to some extent hedge funds and things there. Uh, do they like that industry less than over here? And then how do you typically go about, so coming from that perspective of mm-hmm. wanting to see what other um, companies have acquired other companies for, or like a, let's say like a right. multiple of cash flow or whatever, how yeah. do you go about finding that? Yeah, well, the easiest one is in uh, merger documents, which when a company goes private or is taking over something, there'll be a proxy statement put out with the SEC. That'll yeah. give you that information. Yeah. But in other countries and stuff, there'll be news reports that say, I mean, companies will put out press releases and say it's we paid really this doing, many times EBITDA yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you look it up um, and you'll find out that way. And uh, you can also ask around sometimes about things. I mean, now how do you factor in Mr. Market maybe being in a little bit more of an optimistic mood? So, for example, maybe like um, you're at like a different point in the cycle or stuff like that. Do you have yeah. anything about that? Yes, and that happens sometimes. Uh, we sold a stock recently where I thought Mr. Market got a little excited about the stock. Um, that's not the reason why we sold it, but. Uh, I mean, to give an example of that stock, so we had a stock we bought at like, I don't know, 13 times earnings or something, went to 25 or something, something along those lines, or 15 to 25, something along those uh, lines in the last year, basically. Um, I see the stock exactly the same way when we bought it and when we sold it. I don't value the the fundamental business one little bit differently. There's no no change. I don't value it one bit differently. I don't know if it's changed for like the past 10 or 15 years. Right. But I, I do not value it at all differently. And for some reason... What, do you think the stock went up more than 60%? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was significant. And in terms of earnings and stuff, it went up in the single digits or something, uh, you know. Um, and do you want to explain, Not you don't need to tell a stock if you don't want, but like what that situation was like? Because I feel like you find more opportunities like this in the overlooked space. Yeah, well, well, here's what happened with that stock. So it had a bunch of peers, and everyone who ever looked at it in the, over, in the overlook category, you know, people who focus on sort of the OTC stocks and stuff, said this is a great business, one of the best I've ever seen in the OTC stuff. But it always trades at a discount to its publicly listed peers. It's yeah. peers that are on like the New York Stock Exchange. And I thought, well, that's stupid. It shouldn't trade at a discount because none of these companies are going private. Sure. They've all been public for like decades. You own the stock forever. You get the dividend. You get whether whatever buybacks it does, you get the growth that it does. Yeah. So it has to be in those things that it underperforms, you know? And it just doesn't really underperform compared to its peers that way. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't deserve to trade at a lower P ratio. Uh-huh. But what people will tell you is it does deserve to. And they're not wrong in the sense of if they will expect to make the money this month or this quarter or maybe this year. But this one went up 60% for no reason. Sure. That um, they're right. It, other, they're, they're basically saying, you know, it's uh, what they call a Keynesian beauty contest. They're basically saying, well, I might think the stock is as good 
a, a business as its peers, but everyone else puts a discount on it, so I'll put a discount on it because it's unlikely that it would be uh, sold, you know, tomorrow at a price that's like these other mm-hmm. stocks. But this company did go up more than the other stocks, and also it was it was also trading at a price that wasn't reflecting the the tax cut, the Trump tax cut. Exactly. Right. So that is one p- potential part, which is that yeah. if a stock isn't covered by analysts, and yeah. that was the situation there, uh, that's then there's not as much forward guidance on it, and so people might be paying more attention to the the past sure. uh, that way, and that does happen. So that, that happens a lot with companies that we might own or something that they seem to respond more slowly. So they respond more to like earnings as they happen. Yeah, I was talking to you about a bank that way where I said it, the stock almost follows the EPS. Like it's as if the stock wants to always trade at the same PE. But that doesn't make a ton of sense because the bank has fairly good visibility into what next year's earnings are going to be. But there's no analysts covering the bank. So there's no official posted numbers about this is the forward PE. You yeah. know, So it's possible that people don't, you know, they always look back with those. But if it was a, a big company, then obviously analysts are going to tell you those things. Analysts mm-hmm. are going to factor in the tax cut. But everyone knew there was a tax cut. That wasn't a surprise. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Do you think Warren Buffett has to think about Mr. Market in a different way because he's only allowed to invest in like the top 200 companies in the yes. world? Yeah, I think it's a lot harder. So you think it makes, obviously it does make I it I think those markets harder. are more efficient. I think they're a lot more efficient. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Where do you think that Mr. Market, um, why do you think Benjamin Graham like came up with that philosophy? Do you think it was just to teach his his students just the proper way to think about it? I think it was a core thing of his beliefs because mm-hmm. he had a huge, I think net nets were very important in, in Graham's investment philosophy, way more important than people even think that it wasn't just a, a investment operation. But he was a very logical thinker and net nets are the ultimate in just the illogic of it. It's not- What do you mean by that? It, well, people today think of net nets like it's some statistical thing that just works. Yeah, and so yeah. they do it because it works and that's all they know about it. Yeah. But the actual logic behind it is shows how inefficient markets are. There should not be net nets. What Graham bought were fundamentally sound businesses, maybe not very good ones, and definitely maybe in a recession or depression in their industry or whatever, but businesses that had actually earned money were legitimate businesses. They weren't frauds. They weren't fads. They weren't anything like that. They had built up a bunch of retained earnings. That's how they financed themselves. So real businesses that were worth something alive, yeah. and they were priced at a price that you could liquidate the entire company for and give the shareholders more money than they were willing to pay in terms of market cap. So the the market was valuing them as at a discount to mm-hmm. what they'd be worth if you shut down today, and yet they would be run in the future and make money. Mm-hmm. So, so they, really they were just in all cases. Yeah, I mean, in all cases of a net net, if you offered the um, the let's say it was a private owner, let's say a family owned one hundred percent of a net net instead of the uh, stock market, yeah. and you offered to buy them out at net current asset value, not only would they say no. They would consider the offer so insulting that they would not even begin to talk to you about it. It would not be an acceptable – it would end negotiations immediately if you offered net current asset value for it. And yet there were tons of companies that traded at those levels and and big companies in the U.S. And there have been big companies in Japan that that trade at those levels. There have been companies in Japan that that trade for less than net cash when they've earned uh, from their operations profits every year for the last 10 years. I bought a bunch of them, but there were even more than I bought. I just stopped after I found enough of a basket. I thought there's no point in diversifying beyond this. Yeah, yeah. But you could have found a dozen of them if you wanted instead of six of them. You know, it, it, There are plenty of them. Do you think this whole concept of Mr. Market and being able to take advantage of um, you know, like the volatility and everything mm-hmm. like that, do you think that's going to be more common going forward because – of this like passive bubble, uh, yeah. you know, I guess you could say a uh, theory that a lot of people have been talking about lately, like Mike, uh, Michael Burry, he's been talking about yeah. that and how he thinks that's going to be sort of catastrophic to the market. It might be. I don't know. That is a big thing in Japan. So Japan has a lot of uh, – Japan has less stock picking, basically. Yeah. There's some trading and stuff, but it has less stock picking in the U.S. There's just things that indicate that Japan is less efficient and more um, sort of a, a – there's certain crowd behavior that's more extreme there than in the U.S. in terms of the markets. Um, and if indexing gets to be as big and those sorts of things in the U.S., which it is now, then you could see things that are more like Japan that way. Uh-huh. And uh, it's funny, though, because I invest in things in Japan. People uh, notice that they're Japanese net nets all the time. Uh, they they talk about it and they say, well, these things have been net nets forever and stuff. The returns are g- good in them. Yeah. But they've been around forever and nothing's changed, you know, so they kind of feel like, well, isn't that something that's always there and you don't have to do and whatever, but you would still be beating the market if you were doing it. Uh-huh. So it's it's one of those things. I mean, net nets, they're always like that. As long as they're legitimate companies, you outperform in net nets, but a lot of people won't do it. So if you were managing, I'm just trying to connect with like the people listening. Let's yeah. say $500,000 or less. Right. 
would you focus, you think, 100% of your time on net nets? Or would that just be like a big... Because there's not so many, but probably like I would not or? because I'm an American. Okay. If I was a Japanese investor, I would. No. If I lived in Hong sense. Kong, I would. Uh-huh. I don't know. An, there's plenty of net nets all the time in Hong Kong and Japan. Yeah, sure. I don't know. We've an, talked about a couple. I, yeah, I don't know enough about. I don't live there, so I feel at a disadvantage to the investors there. Now you could invest just quantitatively and do fine potentially, uh-huh. but I feel that I might be at a disadvantage. I don't like getting involved in investments where I think that other people know a lot more about it than I do. Uh huh. And that would always be the case in those countries. So there's not enough net nets in the U.S. I would back in the days that Ben Graham was doing. There are plenty of net nets in yeah. the U.S. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you could through the days that Buffett is part partnership and all that but since like mm, the 70s were probably the last time where there were a ton of net nets that way there was some after the dot uh, dot com crash and all that stuff do you know what um graham's returns were roughly speaking because i know you've read graham's returns in his uh partnership were not amazing they were incredibly low volatility Uh so he did a bunch of things uh hedging stuff and and merger arbitrage and things like that so like what's not amazing a few percent better than the market after fees or something yeah Uh uh-huh interesting Cool. Well, uh, everybody, be sure to check out Chapter 8. That is one of the good chapters out of the Intelligent yes. Investor. Jeff was actually complaining. He wasn't complaining. He just says he likes the the couple of editions before. Uh, the, the, 19, edition. the original edition from, what, the 1950s is great, yeah. and the 1970s one that Buffett was involved with is good, too. Uh-huh. This is the, my least favorite. That's the revised edition. <laughs> the best is the 50s edition, I think. Well, Could you get it on, like, eBay, probably or, like, probably, or, like, Amazon or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Anyways, uh, be sure... What? And then there's the one with the yellow cover and stuff. That's the one that Buffett was involved with yeah. in the 70. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, be sure to check that out. Hey, we're going to be in New York City. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this, and you're interested in meeting with us, reach out to me, info at focuscompounding.com. Check out our YouTube at Focus Compounding, and follow us on Twitter at Focus Compound. Jeff sends out a weekly uh, email. Yes. At focuscompoundinggazette.com. If you like free content, go there man we got so much so much yep. stuff that we're pumping up I'm, so, pr- I'm so proud of us <laughs> okay. i'm so proud of us hope everyone has a great day if you like the work we're doing here give us a rating and review that goes a long way and we'll see you in the next podcast hey this is jeff gannon and that was the focus compounding podcast the podcast where andrew and i talk general investing concepts to learn about specific stocks i like go to focus gazette.com that's focus gazette.com and enter your email once you enter your email you'll start getting one free 2000 word stock right up a week Andrew and I also manage accounts for clients. To learn more about our managed accounts, email Andrew at info at focuscompounding.com or text or call Andrew at 469-207-5844. Thanks for listening.